Welcome to Scan the Future, our 90-minute virtual presentation of NASA's space communications and navigation's vision for the interoperable commercialization of near-Earth space comms. I'm your host, Al Feinberg, and before we meet today's presenters and panelists, please devote the next four minutes and 18 seconds of your attention to this video for a general look into Scan the Future. Scan the Beginning. And we see that communicating to, from, and in space was all NASA, all the time. Our satellites, our infrastructure, our people. Today, some six decades later, filling the vacuum of space communications is competition. Commercial industry has come a long way in the past 40 years. And now, may reliably deliver most of those same satellite services to space-based users in the near-Earth environment that were once the exclusive domain of NASA. So, NASA Space Communications and Navigation, SCAN, will be investigating viability of the commercial space-based networks to meet the needs of NASA missions flying around Earth. Once demonstrated, NASA intends to move away from government-owned and operated systems and procure commercial comms services. NASA cares about the health of the U.S. satellite industry and will work with everyone to promote industry growth, innovation, and interoperability. By 2030, NASA SCAN expects to migrate from the current paradigm of operating and maintaining government communications systems to a new one, where NASA is just one of many commercial customers in an interoperable near-Earth space, exclusively shopping the commercial marketplace for the best and most cost-effective services to support our closer-to-home NASA missions. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and NASA expects the space-based market to grow tremendously over the next few decades. Like the successful commercial crew program, NASA SCAN will trust its more routine, time-tested tasks to industry innovators and collaborators who'll partner to expand satellite industry norms and standards and embrace interoperability. They'll augment existing processes with autonomous operations and navigation services critical for meeting user needs in a highly congested and dynamic environment. Scientists and mission engineers will seamlessly roam space-based relay and direct-to-Earth communications networks, enabling them to immediately access the freshest data, download the most recent revealing imagery, and, at a moment's notice, nimbly turn satellites and telescopes to cover breaking science, like a volcano erupting unexpectedly or a supernova appearing suddenly in the night sky. All in a user-friendly experience as simple and seamless in space as a call with your smartphone on Earth. And the money NASA SCAN saves in near-Earth orbit will help fund game-changing technologies elsewhere, such as multi-GNSS receivers that work at the moon, multilingual space receivers that can be reconfigured on the fly to communicate and negotiate with any provider for access to their networks, and systems like optical and quantum, literally the waves of the future in NASA Deep Space Communications and Navigation. Scan the future, and we see greater efficiency and sharpened focus for NASA. And for our nation and its workforce, a more competitive, innovative, and interoperable space communications industry. NASA Space Communications and Navigation. Scan. Exploration enabled. A quick note, we've planned a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session to follow today's panel discussion. We encourage you to submit your queries in the Q&A chat feature to the right of your screen. 
We'll get to as many questions as possible. We will not be taking any live queries before that. Thus, your microphones will be muted throughout the event. And now we welcome to our virtual stage, NASA Deputy Associate Administrator and Program Manager for SCAN, Space Communication and Navigation, Badri Yunus. And with Badri is a special guest. Badri? Yes, hello. Thanks, Al, for a nice presentation. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, everyone to NASA's big move to commercial com communications and navigation capabilities. As Al said, I'm Badri Yunus. I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator and uh, Program Manager for Space Communication and Navigation, known as SCAN. We are a division located within the Human Exploration and Operation Mission Directorate at NASA. Uh, from my perspective, this is truly an exciting time. Um, a lot has changed over the past few decades. Uh, our push for a stronger par uh, partnership with the commercial industry is real and is growing rapidly. The commercialization of space is at the heart of NASA's objectives and has the full support of uh, the NASA leadership. To help me demonstrate this high level interest, I am joined uh, today by our special guest, my boss, Ms. Kathy Leaders, the Associate Administrator for all of NASA's human exploration and operations. Many of you have known uh, Kathy prior to her appointment at the uh, AA for uh, HEO. Kathy uh, has a, uh, an extensive experience working with the commercial industry. Prior to her becoming the AA for HEO MD, Kathy successfully managed and led the commercial crew program that ensured the return of human space flight capabilities to NASA. Please join me in welcoming mm -hmm. Kathy, who will say a few words to highlight the, the, this fact and to welcome you to today's event. Kathy. Thank you, Badri. I really appreciate um, you having me here today. This is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, and as I've, I talked to Baji a lot, you know, before I took this job, I did not, you know, I always had depended on the, the capabilities of SCAN, um, but well, it's really uh, opened my eyes over the last four months, the amazing work that the SCAN folks do. I mean, SCAN is really, I think they're the unsung heroes of our missions. Uh, without SCAN, without communication, science missions don't have data. We're not able to collect the information that we get from having our probes go out or, and all the other aspects of the mission that we learn from. And as we know, and I know from um, having the cargo program and the, the crew program, uh, you, you need calm to be able to conduct your missions when they're going well and when they're going bad. And so I really appreciate the whole team out there that makes that happen kind of seamlessly every day. And this is a big step for us because we're, we're now looking at, um, at once again, moving and changing a critical capability and seeing if industry can support this. You know, um, you showing the great amount of interest to be here today to hear about our plans to move away from a government provided communications and navigation services for those critical missions that I talked about in near earth orbit and then engage with commercial industry to fulfill those needs. Obviously, these efforts are consistent with our US national space policy. You know, our national space policy states that the government should purchase and use commercial space capabilities and services to the maximum extent possible, or ma maximum practical po extent when such capabilities and services are available in the marketplace and meet our US government requirements. You know, COM capabilities like in the, vi the video we had before, it's obvious to show the growth of COM capabilities that are out there. It is also consistent, <clears throat> and I've kind of had my career be dependent on moving and working towards more and more usage of commercial capabilities in near, near Earth or orbit. Obviously, you know, I've talked about cargo, I talked about crew, we're moving towards more and more commercial usage of the International Space Station. We're looking forward to private astronaut missions to the station 
and eventually having a LEO platform that we can go to, a commercial LEO platform that we can be using in the, in the future after we don't have the International Space Station. So this is another step in our process. You know, having commercial services will benefit the U.S. space economy, and it allows NASA to focus on the bold new missions that we have in front of us to return to the moon, to stay on the moon, and to eventually go to Mars. So I appreciate you all being here. Badri and the SCAN team will describe our efforts in more detail today. They've been doing a ton of work to lay out the plans need your help, we need your interest, we need your innovation, we need your um, thoughts and ideas and innovative ways to, to provide these critical services. And thank you for taking the time today to be here with us. Thanks, Banji. Thank you, Kathy. These are great words. I appreciate your support as always. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I have few few charts. Uh, many of you probably are not familiar with SCAN. Some are. I just wanted to set the stage on where we are and where we are going into, into the future, just to get everyone synchronized to our objectives. That is the interoperable space uh, scenario and capabilities that we are looking for. So, um, Please, uh, uh, Eric, next chart. Uh, SCAN, uh, as, as we defined it as the space communication navigation, uh, responsible for all of the comm support to all of NASA's missions, that's uh, the robotic as well as the human uh, space flight, we provide 24-7 uh, support to all of these missions. Over 100 missions are supported on a daily basis. Uh, from, from ground level all the way into deep space, well beyond the edge of the solar systems. Um, tens of terabytes of data go through our network on a daily basis. Uh, three networks providing that support. We have the Deep Space Network, the oldest of our network, together with the Near Earth Network. That's also as old as the Deep Space Network. And the youngest of all is the Space Network, a constellation of data relaying uh, satellites located uh, in key position in the geosynchronous arc. So SCAN is responsible for developing and operating as well as managing all of these communication capabilities. We also are responsible for working on the technology to enable uh, future mission experience and uh, to enhance it essentially, uh, and uh, make it easy for our users uh, to get the calm need they need and not to burden them with the, with the calm payload such that they have enough room for their, their science instrument to collect more science. After all, we are an enabling entity, we are a support entity for the purpose of science and exploration. Uh, it's our responsibility to manage NASA spectrum on behalf of the agency, both nationally and internationally. We have been extremely active and we, uh, we are a dependable resource within the US government in advancing uh, the uh, NASA's objectives as well as working with industry to advance the industry's objective. We've always thought win-win solutions where NASA can meet its uh, spectrum requirements and get the spectrum it needs while making spectrum available for commercial uh, uh, purposes. We are also responsible for uh, data standards as you know, in particular the space data standards. Space is where we operate so naturally we, we focus on data standards in space and we are an active member of the CCSDS, the Consultative Committee for the uh, you know, deep, uh, Data Standards in Space. We are also an active member of the PNT uh, XCOM uh, board that oversees the, uh, the GPS and all navigation uh, issues. We, we, are, we actively work with other government agencies to advance uh, the, the, the kind of policies that will help us to navigate properly in space and on, on the ground. And uh, SCAN is one of the few programs that's located at NASA headquarters that can represent and negotiate on behalf of the agency on all matters related to space communications. Definitely, we don't live on an island by ourselves. We coordinate with all of the mission directors on a regular basis. Next chart. 
So um, before I, I talk about this chart, I just wanted to, to give you some, uh, some data points from, from before. When NASA first started launching satellites and sending a human into space, the commercial space industry was in its early stages, in its uh, infancy. In uh, those days, NASA had to rely on uh, government-owned and operated ground stations. They were distributed all around the globe in locations that are not possible, uh, you know, not available today from a geopolitical uh, perspective. We are talking uh, 20 to 30 ground stations lo located worldwide on land and sea and air. And it was very costly. Uh, so with the human space flight, uh, especially with the Apollo uh, program, even with all of these stations, we could only support 30% of these missions. Uh, however, we needed, you know, full-time support, more real-time coverage, and we needed to cover the entire globe. And so we uh, we we uh, we worked on a on a concept for a data relaying capability from space, because from space, from a, a couple of points in space, you can see everything that's happening to you underneath below the geosynchronous heart. So uh, we uh, we conceived of the space network. It's a constellation of geosynchronous uh, satellite that provided continuous coverage for all of those missions from launch to splashdown. Uh, you know, so instead of transmitting to ground, all of our mission now transmit through these data point in space. Uh, so uh, NASA's requirements back then were unique and the commercial sector could not meet them by, 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 by any means. Uh, even in the early days of the space network, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we pursued um, uh, space network services through a leasing arrangement with a privately held company. But this model did not, uh, was not successful. Uh, yeah, as, so we kept on pushing for commercialization and we are required as a government agency not, you know, not to compete with the commercial sector. If it's available and can meet our need, we are, uh, you know, it's our duty to go out and get it from the commercial sector. So, and that was the model we use for our near earth network, where at least uh, for the past two to three decades, we relied on the commercial sector to meet a minimum of 50% of our, uh, our requirement for a direct to earth uh, linkage. Now, you know, and, and that's not only now, every time we did, uh, you know, we pursued additional capability, we did due diligence, we studied uh, the, the state of health of the commercial industry to see whether they can meet uh, our requirement. So now we see a different paradigm. The commercialization of space has changed the landscape. So many capable and viable commercial services have been de deployed and or uh, they are in the planning stages to deploy in the future. So given this change, NASA is more than eager to engage with all of you, the commercial sector, to take a you know, the, uh, all of the advancement in ground and, uh, and space network, as well as the evolution of ubiquitous network services for terrestrial users and bring them up to space. NASA's requirements may no longer be unique and could be met with the emergent commercial uh, capabilities. So we are actively seeking the, to transition from our current blend of, uh, com you know, government uh, and commercial to a purely 100% commercial for a direct to earth and 100% in two to three years and 100% through data relay uh, capability in space by the end of this decade. As you all know, the last uh, space network uh, spacecraft, the TDRS, was launched uh, in 2017 and we brought it into operation in early 2018. We are no longer building our own spacecraft. We are very serious about engaging with you partner with the commercial industry to get our support directly from you, either from the capabilities that you have as they are now, or some minor modification. But we are not going to drive that market. We would like to take advantage of that market as we see the space market growing very fast to get a competitive support to our, uh, to our mission. And that defines our new vision and our, our goals. The vision remains interoperable and resilient space and ground uh, communication and navigation infrastructure. And our goal to obtain this high speed, robust and secure, remember that the word secure is very much, uh, uh, you know, needs to be highlighted here, but also the cost effective space communication navigation services 
for all of our future science and exploration mission. So we made it our objective to foster an affordable and growing U.S. space industry, a very healthy and lucrative space industry will help us not only from a space calm perspective, but all, all across the board, it can drive the cost of technology down and, you know, and uh, can drive the commercial, uh, you know, will make things uh, available on the shelf so we don't have to spend uh, to incur all of the NRE to make things happen. And we are really and this is why it's highlighted. We are making a major push to leverage these capabilities to increase efficiency and robustness of our uh, space networks. As we are still you know, going to do the spectrum as well as the data standard and provide leadership in as, far, as far as PNT policies and technologies. But the secret in here, we are going to, uh, to do it in a way to enable the commercial sector. We'll be working with you to overcome the uh, regulatory boundaries and to help you extend your reach to space, uh, you know, for space to space connectivity, as well as uh, making sure that we bridge the data standard uh, situation, um, driving toward commonality between space data standards and all of the commercial uh, standard uh, bodies. And as far as PNT, we are looking at the kind of capabilities that would enable autonomous navigation, not only for our you know, spacecraft, but also for commercial spacecraft. Next chart. So that's what we are looking uh, at, you know, a scenario in the next 10 years, you know, it's going to be an explosion in the number of spacecraft and uh, opportunities up in space, not in terms of uh, only the commercial comm providers, but also commercial uh, businesses go into space to explore opportunities to operate and uh, have assets up there. That's going to drive the way we are going to, uh, you know, uh, to to require the kind of support needed, a robust support. You cannot rely on the way it's been done now. You know, uh, the, the scheduling of these services, uh, people in the loop. We need to push for an autonomous uh, operation environment where a machine can seek support from any provider up there. Um, and also, be able to get the navigation solution on the fly, not to wait for people to send or entities to send these uh, ephemeris vectors up to them to let to let the provider know where they are. These machines will need to rely on uh, you know on cognitive capabilities such that such that they can know a priori you know the state of health of all of the links and the you know how busy the networks are and which network will provide the optimum linkage to, to send its data uh, back to the ground and negotiate access to their networks with them and also we need to overcome the regulatory boundary and the burden we cannot afford to 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 have too many calm payload on board the spacecraft that that's not going to work Every provider works at a different frequency and a different waveform. We need to have the technology and we'd like to push the kind of technology that uh, will allow us to roam in space. A single payload, a small payload that does not burden our user and increase the cost of the spacecraft that will be able to reconfigure itself in both in, in, in frequency and uh, as well as in, in waveform and supported by the, the autonomous navigation, multi-GNSS receivers on board to provide the kind of solution from a time into position in, to navigation solution. All of this are in the work to enable this future interoperable environment, but definitely we need all everyone to play a lot. So we have been pushing the kind of technology that will allow us to reconfigure in frequency and waveform, and also to seek spectrum that's presently not regulated, such as the optical, you know, for the long haul, you know, and for the high uh, data rate uh, needs, you know, it's our fiber cables in space, laser communication are, are going to become a reality more and more in, in the future. So the combination of microwave and RF will provide for that robust environment to provide that seamless support to our users as they roam in space, getting the support when they need it, whatever they need it. Next chart. This is what I've talked about. We'd like to create this interoperable space communication and navigation environment. We'd like to leverage not only the civilian uh, you know, network, but all of the commercial uh, 
uh, networks, domestic and international uh, capabilities to enable that seamless support I I've talked about. So we are pushing very hard for the kind of standards and we are looking very hard at the what's coming out to include out of the commercial sector to include the 5G uh, standards that we can adopt for space use. And um, we are uh, trying to build bridges between the various um, uh, entities to work on a common set of standards suitable for space operation. And not only that, we are working on the kind of protocols, uh, proto communication protocols uh, that will enable proper uh, network management uh, up in space and ensure uh, you know, data delivery between various uh, uh, entities. So uh, from a spectrum perspective, we, we started already the work with the commercial sector. With many of you, they already know, we pushed very hard to get space, that space-to-space -space allocation for, um, for uh, commercial providers to support space-based users. As you all know, many of your assets have been designed to support a suborbital uh, user. They have not been designed to support space-based users. And their ability to support people and spacecraft in space is very limited. So we are working very hard to get that spectrum allocation that will allow you to do so. It's critical and we'll, uh, we appreciate everyone's uh, help in making it happen. And uh, we've so on the agenda for 2013, uh, there is an item that um, that pertain to that space to space um, uh, authorization to operate uh, for uh, fixed satellite service we wanted to also the mobile mobile satellite service to have the same uh, to be considered at the same time but we were not successful we are hoping to work with you to put the kind of pressure that will make that happen you know everything it's going to be a highly dynamic environment highly congested environment every everything has to work with everything up in space and so now we are working um you know very hard on the on the kind of technology that will make that happen the wideband multilingual receiver as well as as well as the cognitive technology that uh, to provide the dynamic and flexible user access as well as enable better security and resiliency Next chart. So um, now before I leave you, um, I just really want to, to express my hope that by collaborating with you, we can achieve a number of things. We can create a viable and thriving commercial marketplace that provides space users with a variety of diverse services, that we can evolve that market uh, together that supports interoperability interoperability is key we can put it at the provider level or we are you know putting it or we can put it at the user level our our you know the place that we can control is at the user level that's why we are uh, building the kind of technology that will allow the user to interoperate with any provider uh, out there and this this way is this thing is very critical you know my objective in life to keep on pushing the envelope on the future communication service services and capabilities and that's why you know by freeing us from doing a routine operation um, and maintenance of exist our uh, government owned and operated system we can refocus our resources uh, to uh, to take the next leap in technology and and the support of the lunar and mars campaign thank you for listening to me and please uh, I'll be looking forward to your questions later on. Thanks. Well, thank you, Badri. We appreciate that. Interoperability being one of the key words, of course. The other one, uh, an another one, is seamless, which is uh, a favorite of our next uh, uh, presenter. Greg Heckler is the NASA Acting Director for SCAN's Commercial Services Office. Greg, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Thank Thanks, Badri. Um, next slide, Erica. I won't belabor this point. Uh, I think Baudry covered a, a good high-level overview of the, the three networks that NASA owns and operates today, uh, that being the Space Network and the Near-Earth Network and, and Deep Space Network. The important thing we need to talk and discuss uh, on this slide or, or today is basically the scope of this effort, right? What are we trying to commercialize, what we are not trying to commercialize? Uh, in the immediate near term, um, what we're trying to do is commercialize services to those users that are in orbits basically geosynchronous or below. Uh, there may be some subtlety there about uh, users that are in highly elliptical orbits, but what we're really trying to do is uh, seek alternatives, right, to the services we provide today through the space network and uh, near-Earth network. 
Um, certainly, maybe in the 2030s, we can start having serious discussions about obtaining commercial services equivalent to uh, the deep space network, right? Getting commercial services for those missions at Mars or Jupiter. Um, but that's not what we're talking about today or, or in the next few years. Uh, next slide, Erica. Baudry spoke a little bit about the near Earth network and the fact that we consider that a, a hybrid network today. Uh, you know, the NEN uh, has uh, many antennas all over the Earth, a uh, kind of small to medium class apertures. Um, today, uh, that hybrid network is composed of uh, government owned and operated stations, uh, such as those at, at Wallops or White Sands or uh, even Antarctica at McMurdo Station. And we combine those government stations with uh, commercial stations, such as those in uh, Svalbard, Sval Norway and uh, partners like uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, you know, for where we get commercial services, uh, we pay for those on kind of a per pass basis, right? Um, we, we aren't special, we don't have unique government requirements. Uh, and so we can find and we have connected to uh, uh, direct commercial services in, in that aspect. And the important thing is, is, is that market, this market as it stands today, uh, for ground station services, we're one of many, right? Um, we're not doing anything special. We're not doing anything unique, and we're able to tap into that com larger commercial market. Um, the NEN, although uh, it is a hybrid market, ultimately the NEN project manager, right, uh, out, out at Goddard is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and ultimately meeting our service level agreements and proficiency standards to with and to our customers. And so it's on the NEN project manager, right, to uh, combine all this net network aggregate capacity, right? In some cases, it's heterogeneous uh, in its capabilities or how we interface with those and deliver on a, a, a virtual network, if you want to call it, that we present to our users. Um, we, we still, and we do, um, still build out government uh, capacity, right, for unique capabilities where there is not a commercial market. I think a good example there is uh, the launch communication stations uh, we recently uh, built to support the needs of SLS in particular. And so that's something we will continue to evolve and, and maintain uh, for, for situations where we have a need for services that are really unique government requirement. They're not an instance where we're one of many. Uh, we will still probably decide to, to pursue uh, government approaches, although I think the, the change in direction is that we're going to make an attempt, right, to go commercial first. Next slide, Erica. The space network, uh, near and dear to me, I spent uh, many years on the TETRIS project. Um, that's our, our eye in the sky, right? The SN was built in concert with the, the space shuttle, right? It was a uh, vital uh, and par important part of that program. And it continues today, right, supporting the ISS. I think we'll have Penny Roberts a later to talk about that. And uh, even the visiting vehicle. We have many science missions as well on the space network. Uh, traditionally, those that have a unique for kind of continuous coverage, or they have a combination of low latency with, with high data volume needs. Um, as Baudry spoke to earlier, uh, we've built our last TDRA satellite. Uh, I was there to commission it, and I was uh, there the last day uh, of the TDRS project uh, before it was closed. Um, but with that last round of the space segment uh, replenishment, we, we have runway, right? We have a good uh, amount of time um, before we need additional Earth relay capacity. And so we're taking that, and we want to take some risk, and we'll speak to that later, where we want to help uh, the commercial industry um, elevate their capability and put us in a position where we can procure Earth Relay or, or SATCOM services uh, from commercial systems. Next slide. This is a, a very, very high level cartoon, right, of how I would describe our, our, our problem or what we're trying to do today, right? It's the 10,000 foot view. Um, I think uh, my colleague, Bill Horn, that I work with at, at headquarters, um, he's called this the, the, the space data transport market, right? Um, moving data between uh, space elements and ground, ground elements. Um, that market really is dominated, right, from a cost perspective or annual expenditures or revenues um, 
space assets, commercial space relay assets, uh, delivering data relay and broadcast services to terrestrial, aeronautical, and uh, sea users, right? If you looked at uh, expenditures from uh, government space uh, agencies, uh, that would be uh, dwarfed by one or two times by what happens in that larger commercial market. Um, as noted earlier, we use commercial ground stations every day, right? That's an existing, um, I would call vibrant market. Um, we use commercial ground stations to talk to our science missions and, and small sets. And even without SCAN, without NASA, uh, we're seeing uh, obvious kind of commercial con to commercial uh, um, relationships build over time as well. So if you had to describe what we're trying to do today, what we're trying to do is take those dotted lines, right, where there's not existing uh, relationships and turn them into solid lines. And so commercial ground stations, we've taken steps already. We just want to fill that out, right, to maybe 100%. And then commercial space relay, where there has not really been any activity. Uh, we, we understand there's been very uh, one or two small set small sat demonstrations with commercial space-based relay systems. That's not something you would bet a, a human spaceflight mission on uh, today. Uh, we're trying to turn those uh, dotted lines into solid lines. And again, uh, transition away from government owned and operated capacity um, to commercial services. Next slide. So this slide you, you may have seen in the video, um, it's high level, what does it really mean? Um, I think this is a snapshot of where we are today. Uh, the one thing to take away from this, and they'll be reinforced with our Q&A panel um, with, with some of our user representatives, we have a diverse mission set with a very diverse set of needs, and we have diverse solutions to meet those needs. Um, some users way there, there on the left, right, uh, use 100% kind of government owned and operated service. Uh, primarily some of the users of the space network. Even users of the near-Earth network, um, some use more commercial versus less, and there's actually a spectrum there. Another recent thing that has started to happen, I would say more often, is that we, we've seen missions that have uh, gone out of family, if you call it that, and have established their own contracts just on a mission basis uh, outside of SCAN or in the agency uh, to commercial uh, service providers. And that's okay, right? Um, but we don't want the agency to be in a position where that's uh, kind of the standard operating procedure. Uh, there have been instances in the past where people have gone out of family and that uh, SCAN has had to bring its, its assets back into play uh, for those particular missions and have uh, exerted great effort, right? Uh, when those missions have required backup or contingency, contingency uh, uh, support. This, Diagram also represents kind of a, a spectrum of operational uh, responsibility. Um, you know, I think I spoke to uh, the near Earth network, right? And ultimately the NEN who does the consolidated scheduling, right? Um, has in the end that operational responsibility. Obviously for those, those missions that have cut contracts directly with the provider, SCAN has no authority there um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, something that's something we, we expect to change and to migrate or, or evolve over time as we go through this commercialization effort. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Erica. So what we're really trying to move, because we have such a, uh, a diverse mission set with diverse needs, we're trying to move kind of the center of gravity over time uh, to a state in 2030 where the vast majority of our missions uh, on orbit operating are kind of taking direct commercial uh, approaches or uh, getting direct commercial services. There's going to be legacy missions. We're going to be unable to transition, uh, specifically those on the space network. Um, there's no commercial alternative for those uh, kind of from a spectrum uh, basis, first and foremost. Uh, and like I said earlier, there may be unique cases where there's missions that still need, you know, may rely heavily on commercial services, but need some additional government services to, to make their mission close. And again, if those are government unique requirements, um, we don't want to be in a position of being necessarily, uh, maybe an anchor tenant is okay, but a really driving unique government requirements on the commercial industry. 
So this is going to be an evolution. It's going to occur over time. Uh, it's going to be a spectrum. But uh, if I had a scale to look at, it should be uh, heavily and obviously biased uh, to commercial services uh, by the time we, we close out the decade. Uh, next slide. And so at a high level, how are we going to attack this problem? I think I spoke to the differences in the market maturity that exists today in standard ground station services for the, versus those provided by SATCOM and connecting those to space users. Um, and so we think uh, for ground services, direct to earth services, we can and will pursue an aggressive transition over the next few years. We're not only going to move new users, but uh, those existing users on orbit or soon to be orbit, move those over uh, as quickly as possible where they're compatible with uh, existing ground, commercial ground stations and, and uh, future commercial ground stations. Um, but we're confident we can do that. Now to address kind of the TDRS problem or the data relay problem, in our assessment, uh, there's not a viable commercial market for services to space users. Um, there are some hurdles there. We wouldn't necessarily, we don't think the market and the commercial capabilities mature enough now to uh, bet the next uh, SMD Earth observing mission uh, on, on those types of services. And so we're gonna pursue a grounds of, of demonstrations, uh, just like we're doing internally today with Optical Com uh, to raise the visibility within the agency to get that stakeholder buy-in. And after those demonstrations, um, we will then infuse those into operations and establish service contracts. So in, in the high level, we sp split this problem into two swim lanes, uh, one more aggressive for the direct to earth type services and a, 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 uh, a more gradual transition uh, for SATCOM or earth relay services. And if you go to the next slide, we're actually spreading the responsibility uh, across the agency. SCAN at headquarters, uh, we're here to help coordinate the spectrum regulatory changes required to use commercial services, uh, getting those allocations for fixed satellite and, and mobile satellite service to space users, which does not exist today. Uh, Baudry talked about investing in technology, things like wideband multilingual terminals that can adapt to different um, service providers' air link standards and uh, allow users to tap into a larger aggregate capacity. And then certainly um, at SCAN, we control the network requirements. And so we're gonna be the technical authority for determining when and where we'll actually move out on commercial services uh, for acquisition and, and infusion into operations. The Glenn Research Center, which you'll hear from next, we're asking them to manage the communication services project we're uh, tasking them with uh, those space-based relay demonstrations I, I spoke to in the last slide, and they want to use the, the COTS approach, right, the co uh, commercial orbital uh, transport services approach that was used by the agency earlier in the decade, last decade, um, to do those rounds of demonstrations and put uh, those commercial vendors with uh, Earth relay capabilities in place uh, to offer operational services back to the agency. Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, you know, who own and operate the space network and near Earth network, we're asking them to rapidly onboard some of those new DTE providers, uh, provide that aggregate capacity um, to our users. And then furthermore, uh, we understand uh, certainly within the near Earth network, um, there's uh, probably gonna be activity to divest from some of our existing ground stations where there is a true commercial al alternative. And certainly we're gonna ask Goddard to maintain the space network uh, until that last customer is turned off uh, sometime in the 2030s. So with that, uh, thank you. Um, you know, we, we at SCAN, I think Kathy spoke to it, live, die, and dream this part of the business. And uh, we dream about it at night. Uh, sometimes we daydream in it uh, during the day. And so we're really inviting you in this effort to be part of a, that dream. Uh, so thank you, and I'll let uh, Al uh, segue to our, our next host. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. Great presentation, of course. Next up, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we'd like to bring in from the NASA Glenn Research Center, Eli Nafa, who is our SCAN Commercial Services Program Manager, and Tom Caspora, 
uh, CSP deputy manager, and they'll outline the plan for commercializing space-based relay and how NASA and industry will partner to get there. Gentlemen. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Eli Napa. I'm the uh, manager for CSP. Um, I just want to let you know we kicked off the CSP activity in October of 2020, uh, but it was bolstered by a number of studies that uh, were conducted by SCAN, including the 2016 industry studies for the architecture for the, the SCAN network, uh, as well as a 2017 RFI, which we released, and uh, a 2018-2019 BAA, where we awarded eight contracts to study the next generation relay and commercial services. Um, you know, based on those studies, we've developed a three phase approach. Uh, you know, the first phase was to identify uh, the industry capabilities as well as the, the NASA uh, and marry them with the NASA needs uh, for future missions. Uh, the second phase is the demonstration phase, which we're about to embark on. Of course, the third phase is then transitioning to the acquisition services. So with that, uh, we are poised to begin the demonstration phase, and I'd like to introduce my deputy, Tom Caspira, to uh, kind of give you a little bit of understanding of what we're going to be looking for in the demonstration phase. Tom? Thanks, Eli. Uh, next slide, please. So the communication services project will focus on demonstrating the feasibility of commercially provided SATCOM services to NASA missions and their spacecraft. At the CSP Industry Day, which we plan on holding in February of 2021, we will describe the details of our approach. Our first step is to pursue the development and demonstration of these new capabilities, extending to spacecraft what industry currently has in operation to their current land, sea, and air customers. The long-term goal is that future NASA near-Earth missions and other customers will be able to use these flight-qualified capabilities, and NASA may transition from using NASA-owned networks to commercially provided services. The capability demonstration concept is to facilitate a public-private partnership between U.S. industry and NASA for the demonstration of commercial SATCOM's capabilities with the goal of achieving robust, reliable, and cost-effective communications to spacecraft near Earth orbit. Our goal is to develop a service of which NASA can be one of many using this service. On this chart, we show the various classes of NASA missions which can use this service, which helps illustrate the transition from current NASA network services. Next slide, please. A key part of the CSP approach is, the creation, is to support the creation of commercial SATCOM services to meet mission needs. The first step is to support the creation of these services through capability development and demonstrations in partnership with industry. Our CSP Industry Day will describe the approach of our announcement, which will meet the needs of future NASA missions and support companies in developing these services. By describing the NASA needs, industry can add into their needs of other customers as part of their overall market, which can include other government agencies and commercial companies as other users of the new service. Now, let me say just a word here about why do we want to conduct these demonstrations. A capability demonstration is required because NASA cannot currently procure reliable and cost-effective commercial services for its missions. The studies that we have conducted with industry many of who are now part of this town hall have indicated that the time is right to develop these services. So some key points related to that, NASA missions need to see the demonstrated capability to build confidence to use the commercial services. Many US companies have the capability to develop these reliable and capable space communication services. And finally, we're seeing that government and commercial demand for SATCOM services currently exists and represents a market with substantial growth potential. So with that, back to Eli Naffa, next slide, please. So uh, I just wanted to uh, 
uh, give you a little uh, preview of our approach uh, preceding Industry Day, uh, which will be sometime next year. Uh, our approach is uh, focused on demonstrating the feasibility of commercial services during this phase. To do that, we plan to establish public-private partnerships, which would involve uh, shared cost and risk. Public-private partnerships are intended to bolster American industry, uh, which can significantly reduce the cost of communication services to NASA, hopefully, and maximize interoperability between the government and commercial service providers. Uh, and the key is while promoting a diverse commercial market. So we will be seeking proposals with commercial solutions that reflect industry's interests and capabilities. The tenets of our approach are uh, we will be technology and architecture agnostic. Uh, commercial end-to-end -end services will be sought, uh, demonstration of, of a end, end operational service with limited government involvement. And, uh, really not looking for any unique NASA solutions. Uh, we'll be looking to develop robust, reliable, and cost-effective capabilities. Uh, and the goal really is for NASA to be one of many solutions. We'll be promoting, uh, hope to promote diverse and growing commercial SATCOM industry in support of our uh, Leo commercialization goals. Uh, our expectation, as we stated before, is to spur uh, new SATCOM markets where NASA is one of many customers for the new commercial services. And um, really what we want to get out of these capability demonstrations is uh, you know, performance validation, operational constructs, and acquisition models that we're going to need for to acquire the commercial services in the future. Next chart, please. So. Uh, our forward plan, obviously, is uh, to, to do an initial set of demonstrations that uh, hopefully will define the acquisition approach for the transition to commercial services in the FY25 timeframe. Uh, but we also plan to have the ability to on-ramp uh, new services beyond the initial capabilities that we demonstrate uh, with a rolling wave of demonstrations uh, throughout the decade. Uh, that would allow for additional opportunities, bring on new industry capabilities as they become available and as uh, future NASA missions are defined and our needs are dictated. Uh, so if we go to the next chart. Uh, next step is really for us is uh, Industry Day, uh, which is yet to be announced, but uh, probably be late January, February timeframe next year. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned to the CSP website, which is listed here in the NASA procurement website for that opportunity. And um, we'll go to the next chart. I just want to show you our contact information is, is here. Uh, my information, Tom's information, and Michael Pepin is our lead systems engineer. We are interested in your thoughts. So please don't hesitate to contact us. If you have any questions or uh, if you have any comments to what you've seen today, thank you for your time, and we're really looking forward to getting started with uh, with the demonstrations next year. That's it for me. All right, Eli. Thank you so much, and thank you to you too, Tom. Uh, for those of you who didn't get a chance to uh, uh, screen print your uh, the screens there and freeze them, uh, we will also be having updates. Uh, as they as we get the information on our nasa.gov slash scan website and we'll show you that URL later in case uh, you didn't copy that um, and of course uh, NASA scan is also looking to become a, man, a customer of direct earth services uh, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center we're going to welcome now uh, Dr. Lynn Nietzsche Tate who's the chief of Goddard's commercialization innovation and synergies office We'll share how the switch to commercial DTE will shape up there. Lenitra? Thanks, Al. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as Al said, I'm Lenitra Tate from the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Exploration and Space Communications Division. And today I will provide an overview of Goddard Space Flight Center's plan to support SCAN's commercialization approach. Next slide, please. 
So um, NASA organized its earliest networks to enable Mercury, Gemini, and the Apollo programs. And during these programs, Goddard served as the hub of the manned space flight network. So nearly all of the communications with the spacecraft were channeled through Goddard before being sent to mission control. So we at Goddard, we have over 60 years of collaboration with various NASA centers and industry uh, being a leader in that space to ground interface for space communication. So today, the Exploration and Space Communications Division is reorganizing the operations and management portion of our division to align with SCAN's vision of commercialization. And we will do this in collaboration with SCAN headquarters, uh, as well as in collaboration with the Glenn Research Center industry um, to accomplish this new model for commercialization. Next slide. Um, as Baudry and Greg discussed, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center operates two of the three uh, space networks, the Near Earth Network and the Space Network. Um, pioneered by SCAN, SCAN pioneered the use of commercial providers to support low Earth orbit, and it has been employed by the NIN since the early 2000s. The success of the NIN to date and that blueprint that we've established in using commercial providers to support low Earth users will now foster a solid framework to establish the new near space network. With this new model, and as you heard earlier from Greg and Baudry, we are evolving our approach um, to rely 100% on industry provided services by 2030. And we are excited to um, continue our strong collaboration um, with um, Glenn Research Center, JPL, SCAN, and commercial providers and users. Next slide, please. Um, and just to add to the framework, this framework includes a legacy of a supporting a diverse set of missions to include everything from launch vehicles to technology missions, missions as, as well as um, the entire mission life cycling for mission design, compatibility testing, and spectrum analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So we're looking to the future, um, and what we have done at um, Goddard Space Flight uh, center, so we've taken some initial steps. We have established the Commercialization, Innovation, and Synergies Office, which will directly engage with industry to, one, share the user's community's uh, mission needs, as you'll hear in our panel following uh, my presentation, and we will identify and incorporate commercial service providers of uh, planned and existing capabilities in SCAN's overall strategic planning. And this will ensure that all interested parties have the opportunity to join the new near space network as a space link provider. So this new near space network, it will implement, operate, and maintain a data system capable of connecting national and international data link providers. It will provide that interoperability that we've heard so much about today. So the near space network, will provide services for near space region defined as 2 million kilometers from Earth. This includes the moon and out to the Lagrange point. So this offers a single entry point and interface for near space missions to map broad spectrum of provider capabilities with diverse and unique user needs. And we will do this in partnership with industry, SCAN headquarters, and Glenn Research Center. Next slide. So in July, we released an RFI on commercial DTE services, and we recently released the RFI on lunar communications. And these were first steps in evaluating the scope and the breadth of the potential expansion of commercial partnership and really understanding the current and planned capabilities through the 2032 timeframe. So over the next uh, several months, uh, very similar to what Gar uh, Glenn, Space, uh, Glenn Research Center will be doing, we will be engaging directly with industry. We will hold several um, um, uh, industry and virtual events and just create a cadence of engaging with industry. And this will um, create a reliable and agile network for users where we can leverage the capabilities and services of industry while at the same time creating a robust marketplace 
and um, offer an opportunity for very creative and cost-effective solutions. Next slide. So if you have any questions, as Al said, I am the Chief of the Commercialization, Innovation, and Synergies Office at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Ms. Kira Blackwell is the Commercial Engagement Manager. And uh, Mr. Veer Thonvi is the Project Manager for our new Near Space Network at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Anitra, thank you very much. And remember to keep an eye on our NASA SCAN webpage for those virtual industry day dates uh, for Space-Based Relay hosted by Glenn and by Goddard for DTE. And there's the uh, uh, our URL you can see at the bottom of our tagline. And before we meet our three panelists, let's bring back Glenn Heckler, who is NASA SCAN's Acting Commercial Services Manager, who will join me as co-moderator for the panel discussion. Greg, uh, this is a great panel you've put together. Yeah, you know, um, SCAN, we're there to represent all the user interests, right, and, and needs in the agency. Um, sometimes you need to know when to get out of the way. And so I think we, we have three great representatives from three of our important uh, user bases or customers. Um, Penny Roberts, who uh, we conspire with every day um, to, to maintain the, our comm needs for the ISS and expand on those. Um, we have Florence Tan who chairs the small sat coordination group and uh, Jeff Hayes, who represents our science mission director at customers. Great, Greg, thanks. And indeed, each of our three panelists, as you mentioned, represent an important NASA comms user and each has specific needs, but uh, we believe that taken together, their comments should provide everyone with insights as to how your innovation in, commercial, in the commercial industry and commitment to interoperable near Earth space communications will revolutionize science and human discovery and foster extraordinary growth within the commercial space industry. Uh, Florence Tan, uh, just to introduce you uh, folks a little bit to Florence, those who don't know her, she compares her promising new frontier of small sats to the wild, wild west. As chief of NASA's small sat coordination group, Florence sees today's commercial service providers much like the frontier merchants of the late 1800s, whose supplies and services were essential to the pioneer's Western expansion. Both parties benefited and flourished, and not to mention the nation. Uh, with a giant house in space, Penny, Penny Roberts understands how comms keeps it flying and its inhabitants safe, all while maintaining the world's only laboratory in microgravity. As avionics development and integration office manager for the International Space Station, Penny will share how ISS uses COM by taking us through a day in the life of a station astronaut. But first, let's bring in Jeff Hayes, discipline scientist of NASA's Heliophysics Division in Science. We call Jeff NASA's science, science's big data guy, from Hubble to Voyager and New Horizons, among others. Jeff has had his hand in practically every major NASA science mission over the past dozen years. And Jeff, Really great to have you here. Uh, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, issue of stove piping. I think this is part of our conversation that you and I had about uh, different missions and uh, perhaps not being able to share all the data uh, between them and, and what that does uh, for exploration in general. Um, thank you, Al, and hello to everyone out there in the on the interwebs. Um, could I have my first slide? Before I answer your question, Al, I'd like to actually bring up my first slide. Actually, the next one then. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice slide. It is a pretty slide, but the next one is actually, this is the science fleet that SMD currently operates. And actually, uh, Florence is going to present another slide that has just the CubeSats, so there'll be some overlap, small sats and CubeSats. But there's about 130 odd missions that are listed here, something like that, of which about two thirds, almost 70% are currently operating. And so I just wanted to say that the portfolio you're looking at, that's one way of looking at it. So we, we break them out into the five science divisions that SMD has. I work in two of them, astrophysics and heliophysics. But what I want to say is that the portfolio is both incredibly broad and very diverse in all, all senses of those words. So 
for example, in the upper right hand corner of that slide, you'll actually see Voyager one and two. And over close to the sun, you'll see something called Parker Solar Probe. Parker Solar Probe gets in within 30 solar radii of the surface of the photosphere of the sun. That's a tenth of an astronomical unit. Voy the Voyagers are now roughly 140 astronomical units. That's about 13 billion B, billion with a B, miles out, and they move about 270 million miles a year. So obvious, and they are still, both of these missions are sending back incredibly useful and significant scientific data. Uh, the Voyagers are actually in the interstellar medium. They are in Star Trek land, you could actually say. But getting back to your stovepiping now, the way that science has been done for actually hundreds of years, and certainly since the dawn of the space age and NASA, is that there have been specific divisions that have been responsible for certain subdisciplines of the science. And that has led to a certain amount of stovepiping because all experts and all subject matter experts will come up with their own nomenclature and their own way of thinking and interpreting data. It also doesn't help that they actually store their data in different formats and therefore have different, if you like, metadata. Metadata being a new word. Uh, it has taken the science community about 35 years, about as long as I've been a practicing astrophysicist, to come to the grips with the fact that we actually need common data sets, data formats, and common ways of describing how the data was taken and how the data was calibrated. And so, for example, astronomers, all astronomers all around the world, everywhere, use a single data format, which makes for using the word interoperability very trivial. We're also now working on standardizing the metadata. How do you, for example, how do I describe a date in a data format? Okay, in the United States, it's month, day, year. Almost everything else, everywhere else, it's day, month, year, or it's month, day, year, or it's Julian date, or it's civil date, or you see the you see the problem. And I'm just talking about what day of the year it is. So obviously, if we don't get that right, we're never, it's going to be hopeless. But we have made tremendous strides on going down that path. And But SMD isn't perfect, and we are still working with this. And in fact, uh, there have been a number of working groups and a couple of industry days that I've been involved with on exactly coming to grips with big data. And of course, that's a buzzword that everyone uses now. But for example, uh, the Earth Science Division in SMD holds about 150 to 200 peta petabytes of data. Uh, heliophysics is very close to 30 petabytes of data. The other divisions aren't so, don't have as large a data holdings, but that's going to rapidly change and rapidly increase simply because the type of science we're doing now is evolving away. And this gets back to what Badri and, and Greg were talking about in terms of needing to evolve away from a NASA government unique solution, but in fact, something that requires thinking out of the box that we've been thinking about for decades. For example, uh, most of the easy science has been done with, if you like, a single science mission that thinks about a certain subset of science data. For example, if I'm an X-ray astronomer, I have an X-ray mission that looks at subject objects in X-rays. The problem is I've now solved most of the big problems. Now I need to get into the subtle problem. So all of a sudden now I have to look for transient phenomena because if I look at something in the night sky, I'm being pejorative as an astronomer here, I'm only looking at it as I can. It's a snapshot if you like in time. I can't monitor the sky. That's a huge difference. The Earth Science folks do this all the time, of course. They have multiple satellites that, you know, monitor the Earth because A, the Earth changes on an hourly basis, if not a minute basis. But also there are long period variabilities that play a role not only in weather, but also climate. 
and also other phenomena. We're now discovering that in both astrophysics and geophysics and planetary, planetary atmospheres evolve, for example. The sun has a 22-year periodicity, which our friends in the ComSat, ComSat satellite world actually know about because that does affect them. Um, there are astrophysical phenomena that are long period. There are short transients that last, that decay off and last an awful long time. And the problem is we don't have the ability to get that data down because we can't right now. Because we, an opportunity for- Exactly right. That is exactly right. Sorry, I'm, I'm going on because I was a former professor, so I will pontificate until the cows come home. Uh, but the idea is that commercialization of communications and navigation and the idea of getting to a point where I think autonomy was talked about as well in, the, in terms of navigation, but autonomy in terms of decision making, actually having an AI on board a spacecraft that could whistle up another spacecraft and say, oh, in this part of the sky, I saw something really interesting. You telescope, why? Go off and look at it there as well, because I don't have the same instrumentation that you do. And, and, and that is more a problem today, right, with scheduling uh, and not being able to, I think we use the term nimble in the uh, in the video, not being able to do that nimbly. And right. uh, in this case, we could do that. Greg, you wanted to offer it, something? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And if I, I want to build on that, Jeff, um, you know, the one thing our systems do well is talk to one user at a time, right? Yep. <laughs> Certainly our ground, ground-based ground apertures and, you know, even TDRS as it stands can really only talk to, to three customers at any instant. In the commercial systems, especially when we talk about SATCOM capability, those are designed to talk to hundreds and thousands of individuals on the ground at the same time. And so if we had that capability and apply that to space users, then we could have that's transformative to address those science cases that Jeff spoke to, but also how we do operations, right? If I didn't have to pre-schedule a pass, if I could just ping my satellite uh, or you know turn it on like I do my cell phone, that's gonna change how we operate uh, just day to day and then also the science we can deliver for the agency. So those are one of those win-win situations. I think uh, we've lost out on right over the last few years and the opportunity cost has risen too high and that's one of the reasons we're, we're making this decision today. Right, and to be fair, sorry, did not, didn't mean to cut you off, Al. But the other thing too is science is suffering from the same disease, right? The missions that we wanna do are just too expensive at some level to be a one-off thing that goes from cradle to grave. I mean, it's much, much too expensive. And an example of that is, for example, Webb. It will be a fabulous telescope when it's launched and it will tell us, I'm hoping transform, transformationally interesting science about the early universe. But I mean, it's an ex very expensive proposition to do something like a Webb. And a lot of science is now to the point where I've done the easy stuff. Doing the hard stuff is actually hard. And, and segueing off of what Greg said too, one, one bus, one, one comm stream, we're starting to launch, SMD's now starting to launch constellations. And Florence will talk more about that because that's more in the realm of small satellites and stuff. But the idea is now if I have a swarm, literally of satellites, how do I do that? And I can't do it with a NASA asset because we're not designed for that. That's not what we do. But commercialization could potentially help us. So before we, before we move on to Penny, let's talk about uh, just a quick example of the holy grail that we mentioned of science right now. And, and how oh, the answer? You mean 42? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, about supernovas. Mm. So one of the holy grail of, of astrophysics and, and any scientist, I think at some level, is trying to capture a super, supernova on the rise. A supernova is when the core, a star reaches the end of its normal life cycle, I'll put normal in the Dr. Evil quotes here, and collapses within the space of a couple of hours, actually minutes. And then you get this tremendous, so the core of the star implodes, the material and the outer shells collapse in, and then because there's still hydrogen, helium, and lighter elements that can still go through nucleosynthesis, explodes and pretty much sends 90% of the mass of a star into space. 
we've actually never seen one on the rise. They, what they do is they rise very sharply, as you can imagine, something collapsing the mass of 10 times the mass of the sun, collapsing in a couple of hours. That's hugely fast. It brightens extremely fast and then tails off. We've never seen that. We've come close, but we've never actually seen a light curve for a supernova to go off. And the reason why supernovas are so important is that they use their standard candles. The maximum brightness as a supernova is pretty much the same wherever you are in the universe. So if I see a supernova in a really remote galaxy, I know how far away it is, and therefore can calculate the scale and the size of the universe overall. And that, that is a holy grail. And that's, the Hubble was trying to do that back in the 20s. So, you well, know, hopefully we'll, we'll get there with commercialization for sure. That will give us that opportunity. Great, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Let's bring in Penny now to discuss uh, what commercialization can mean for the International Space Station upgrades. And uh, Penny, you're gonna share with us a little bit about how, uh, uh, what you deal with uh, daily in the life of a, a ISS, ISS comm uh, and uh, uh, an astronaut on board. Yes, thank you, Al. Um, welcome to my world. I, I wanted to spend a bit of time talking to the commercial providers about what matters to human spaceflight when it comes to communications. Now, we expect to continue to use the comm assets that NASA has provided to us because our vehicle is now designed around those assets. But we're hoping to attach commercial elements to our platform and take that platform and go um, separate from the ISS as a commercial platform all by itself. And COM is incredibly important that we start off with commercial communications versus relying on our unique communications. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what life is like on the space station. So imagine yourself in your house, sealed tightly, launching into orbit and going around the earth 7,000 meters per second and conducting experiments and um, communicating with your loved ones and how important communications will be to you. And as you can see on this title slide, you will see our TETRIS antennas, the big six foot dishes, our S-band antennas, which go through TETRIS as well for critical communications, as well as small Omni antenna here, which is important for recovery of the vehicle if we lose control of our attitude and lose control of lose knowledge of our attitude. And so things like that are incredibly important. As you notice, we have two strings of both of these items because it's important to us that we have redundancy and can reestablish calm quickly. Next slide. So here's day, the beginning of a day. Beginning of the day actually begins when they go to sleep. And when they go to sleep, they often go onto social media and tweet and various other things like that, which requires a two-way comm link that allows them to upload videos and download messages and things of that nature. And so it's a constant two-way exchange. We use commercial technology, and I imagine the commercial element will do it as well. And that commercial technology requires operating system updates, um, security patches, et cetera. And we have been challenged by our communications link and our data networks supporting those kinds of upgrades. Um, we couldn't transition an iPad for, I think, almost nine months. And then all of a sudden, it just happened overnight when nobody was looking, kind of like what happens at home. <laughs> While they're sleeping, we keep operating the vehicle. We have operators in mission control in it, Canadian Space Agency, that attach payloads to external platforms. This is EcoStress being attached to the JAXA's exposed facility. And that payload actually sends its data to the space station using these little antennas you see there um, at, over a Wi-Fi link. And then we use DTN, Disruption Tolerant Networking, to transmit those files to the ground. And that is happening all night long. We're downloading images that the crew has taken pictures of, and we're uploading procedures and videos and things of that nature to help the crew do their experiments. When they wake up, one of the first things they do is check their email, just like we do. We recently transitioned the crew to 
O365, Microsoft O365. That did not work. <laughs> One interesting phenomena that occurred is that when we uploaded it for the first time, we actually consumed all 21 megabits per second of our forward link to the space station to get the email that was in their box onto their system. So it's an interesting phenomenon. We ended up not being able to do user authentication. Um, we were we had figured out a way to do it without PIV badges, but nonetheless, there was issues with timing, with delays, with things of that nature. So I can't imagine living up in space without email. So that's going to be something we have to tackle. We've done a workaround by keeping our systems going on the ground right now. And then the astronauts go back home, but the guys that are left behind are women that are left behind on the space station watch what's going on. And so we often are uplinking data to them. And this example is a Soyuz landing and the astronauts are watching that landing occur. We also do research. So now they're up there doing an experiment and it's tied into a, a school at somewhere on the earth. And they're doing a demo and discussing with high schoolers or middle schoolers experiments that oftentimes the middle schoolers or the high schoolers actually fly up to our vehicle. And so we have really rapid turnaround and we have intimate communications one on one. And when these media events happen, like a phone call to the president of the United States, you like to know they're going to happen on time and we have backup and we dry run it and we've made sure everything's going to work just right. And so timing on these two-way audio, two-way video is very important. Next slide. So an example of an experiment and how communications fits into that experiment. This is Chris Cassidy. He was commander, just came home. And he's got a camera up here. It's a camcorder. I think it's a Canon camcorder. And he's videotaping what he's doing and it's being streamed to the ground live real time and there's a researcher on the ground that's talking with him that's not a toothbrush it's a handheld microphone and they're talking about the experiment that he's doing and he's um it's a two-way audio exchange with a, somebody located somewhere and it's live video being streamed to their desktop and when i say real time i mean 0.6 second round trip delay and we literally do real time high rate. Right now, our link is at 600 mega symbols per second, and our forward link is at 25 mega symbols per second. And we use those links, maybe not the downlink yet because we just upgraded it, but we're working on it. Um, we have an upcoming activity where they want to stream video at 200 megabits per second from the space station for a live event. And so uh, that gives you a feel for how we use our links. And the other thing is that this digital picture is the picture of the thing he's holding in his hand. And we, for any ISS mission, which is an expedition mission of six months, we downlink tons of video and tons of imagery, which are used by researchers and, and people interested in human spaceflight. So it's a, it's a highly intensive um, set of data going up and down. We use common standard protocols such as SSH, HTTPS, RDP, CFDP, DTN, UDP, and SFTP. And boy, there's a lot of letters, but they're standard protocols that we do, which rely on two-way handshaking, and it relies on slow, very little delay. Next slide. The last part, of, well, not the last part, I've got one more slide, but I would like to talk about nominal vehicle operations and contingency operations, because our biggest concern about going to commercial calm is the help desk <laughs> and the redundancy and things of that nature. So we constantly monitor the space station. So imagine you're flying this gigantic vehicle. You're up in space. You can't go outside. You, you want to know that everything that you need to live safely is being monitored and tracked. So constant data to the ground. And you can't spend all your time tweaking the systems. And so there's a lot of work that's done by ground operators to keep their systems running and detecting any off nominal conditions like a slow leak, which is what we've been trying to track down for a couple of months, is where's the slow leak? But the astronauts didn't detect that leak. It's data coming to the ground, being looked at by operators and operators going, wait a second, what's going on here, right? And so 
And when an emergency happens, we will rapidly go from single string calm to two strings of calm. And we will rapidly make decisions to maybe go put, get yourselves into two space vehicles, establish calm with those two space vehicles right away and quickly bring up all those communication assets. This astronaut holding onto an antenna, that's our six foot antenna dish where we decided that there's no point in a laboratory if you can't get your data to the ground. And we did have, we had single point failures outside. And so we decided to put another boom up and it'll land another antenna up. And when you're doing that and you're messing with your comm system that you're also communicating with, because the video only comes down through KU band through Tedros, that real time video is important to ensure safety and detection of issues, right? And so figuring out how to do that kind of an upgrade without disturbing the communication system is critical and it's in partnership. When we did this upgrade, it was in partnership with the space network. Similarly, when we, if you upgrade a commercial comm system on orbit to that next thing, we have to be able to work closely with that commercial comm provider and make sure that that handoff happens seamlessly. Um, the last thing, well, obviously, if a spacecraft launches from the ground, goes up, docks with our vehicle, we track that all the time, right? And we communicate across the board. It actually even communicates with us, and we can send commands through our teachers link to that, that vehicle. And all of our commercial vehicles right now are designed to use NASA services. That means their trajectories, their guidance and nav algorithms, their failover scenarios are all based on using Space Network and Tedris and Mirror Earth Network. We need to transition to them being able to use commercial services so that we can and have that confidence that they have the same reliability, same coverage, same robust architecture. And so that's one of our challenges with going to commercial comm is weaning them off of our services onto a commercial provider service. Last thing I wanted to point out, and I think I'm running over my time, are these little satellites down here. And, and it's a point that, that Baudry made. It's a point that I think um, Florence is going to make. The frequency issues associated with communication of these little satellites and working with us is really challenging. Anything we could do to get past all those regulatory hurdles and basically have dial-up service would be very nice. Next slide. The last thing that really is a consideration when it comes to a space station, whether it be a commercial space station, whether it be an international space station going around the moon, is getting the data everywhere. Right now, we have two distribution hubs. We have operations distribution hub out of Houston and a payload distribution hub out of Marshall. And all of that requires the things listed here, which I'll let you read on your own time, but they're very important things. And there was one last point I wanted to make. And I can't remember what it was. So it's all yours, Al. How about congratulations on the 20th anniversary of the space station coming up this weekend? Yes, that's a wonderful. I can't believe we've been flying people for 20 years. <laughs> uh, October 31st is the uh, was the launch. And I believe it's November 1st or 2nd is the actual uh, when uh, Bill got up there. Right. I believe so. Thank you so okay. much. Really appreciate that. And uh, with, with that, let's go over to Florence. And Florence, uh, I think Penny set you up pretty well to discuss uh, small sats and uh, something that uh, you have, uh, I teased earlier that uh, the small sat realm, if you will, uh, you consider to be kind of like the wild, wild west. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi, Al. Thank you. And um, I'm really well set up uh, from my fellow panelists for uh, teeing me up here. Um, so, uh, please, uh, put out my first chart, not, I guess the, yeah, yeah, this one. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I like to think about, I like, you know, I like to look at history and, and I think this is a really transformational time for Leo. Uh, the, the fact that we have now regular access to space, um, it is in great demand in our community. We're all highly motivated to uh, utilize these right share opportunities to advance our multiple science exploration and technology demonstration ob objectives. And more and more groups, not just us, right? Industry uh, and other nations are launching small sets into space. And this represents an era of growth uh, in uh, low earth orbit. And this is akin to our conquering of the West. And with the transportation advancement comes uh, 
the need for communication, certainly very great communication. And our small sats uh, applications in astrophysics, heliophysics, earth technology demonstrations, human exploration, um, applications such as remote sensing, terrestrial space weather forecasting, now casting, all these communication, all these will need communication services. And um, next chart, please. So I just wanted to show you our, you know, similar CubeSat, uh, small sat fleet chart for the agency. And this represents not just SMD, but HUMD and STMD as well. Uh, that's uh, the Science Mission Directorate and Human Exploration and Operations Mission, Mission Director and the Space Technology Mission Directorate. We definitely recognize now since the publication of uh, Thomas Zubrukin's National Academy studies about small sets and its utilization that it is transformational. It is a platform for science, for exploration, for technology. And we can make measurements now that otherwise cannot be done using small sets, temporally, spatially, spectrally, you know, all these different ways of looking at data from multiple viewpoints. So looking at this chart, there are over 100 CubeSats in the short uh, less than, I would say 10 years or so that NASA started looking at, at uh, small sets and CubeSats. It's a different way of measuring uh, our environment to achieve our science and our exploration objectives. There are over 100 uh, CubeSats and every year we add to it. We have launched over 40 of these things and there are about 60 odd number uh, under a development and a few that we have a few more that is, you know, under us uh, that will be selected every year. Like I said, it's being announced. So these missions are, are, are very um, important. Uh, they don't actually go around the sun, but they're mostly in low Earth orbit. The, even the Helio ones uh, are in low Earth orbit. And um, and it is uh, uh, very key in our um, understanding of, of our environment now. Uh, it turns out that ground station availability is uh, the primary limitation to expanded science. Um, we have um, different design reference missions that are coming up, like the new observing strategy where we design, we, we will deploy a, a sensor web, web of sensors in orbit um, to uh, coordinate observations, track dynamic and spatially distributed phenomena, uh, and assimilate, assimilate the data into models, analytic flows, and then feed the observation back into the sensor web, you know, like, like uh, um, uh, Jeff said, you know, to say, hey, go swing this, this uh, satellite and look at this one, you know, forming a uh, storm in the middle of the Pacific or whatever it is, you know, and, and just acquiring that data and integrating it in a complementary manner and building up a, a complete uh, in-depth picture of the phenomena is something that our, you know, we would like to do. And this kind of in data intensive operation requires robust, highly reliable, global, persistent, high available, high, uh, low cost ground systems that, that, you know, web services that are integrated again with, with uh, a uh, open and secure means, you know, some kind of uh, a, a cloud uh, service that will allow our PIs from different areas to, to uh, look at the data concurrently and be, be, be more, re, um, you know, uh, tactical and in nature. So this actually, this kind of description of a, of a design um, uh, applies to not just space, uh, earth we uh, terrestrial weather, but space weather, which is an up and coming, uh, um, very, very important part of our uh, mission objectives. Um, so the, uh, I hope you can see how great impact uh, the small missions have on agency objectives by, by my description. And the, the, this, 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 techno this platform and this type of technology it is so important uh, because if you can deploy a, a constellation of these sort of uh, sensors, we are able to make these new measurements that will otherwise, there's otherwise too expensive to make with our single big expensive satellites and, and, and therefore increasing our capabilities. Um, they are real and measurable and the potential is certainly very, very great. So um, let's go to the next chart, please. So this uh, is the, the way I'm thinking about from the point of view of um, 
why what we want uh, in terms of uh, available um, systems and services that that we would need. Um, Greg said it. Uh, inoperable is is a really key thing. One of the biggest uh, uh, frustrations for our young, our you know, they're mostly new uh, uh, early careers that do these small sets for us because they they started as as you know toys in the '90s and eventually you know being recognized as a science and uh, uh, exploration and technology demonstration vehicle. Um, the the lack of uh, a, a way of communicating uh, our data, you know, even when we start build, when we start, when somebody wins a proposal, they, the, the idea of arranging your own communications is very daunting. So um, think of a, a situation where um, you have a young PI who just won a small set uh, award and they don't know how to communicate. And, you know, it's, it's not just as Barry says, we also had to have uh, a, a regulatory uh, environment that is is very um, friendly towards uh, making that connection, so that the availability of of a communication system is not clearly uh, laid out for small set as a big set. Um, our 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 PIs um, often have to essentially learn uh, to work with say providers including you know for example radios uh and they often use the the radio that somebody through word of mouth say oh i've done this before let me use you know and then you find out okay maybe it doesn't work for this situation so or or, or even all the things that that is um perhaps that radio launched and and they didn't understand how it, you know the in interfaces so all these interoperable issues sometimes come up in, in addition, um, reliability is, is uh, an issue, uh, affordability, and of course, low swap because these are small spacecraft. Uh, we certainly would love to have a higher data rate that is, of course, globally persistent, uh, at that, that we should be able to get data. If, say, uh, the, wall, the ground station at Wallops has, has, is down because it's uh, under repair because it's you know, on these turrets that are uh, actually uh, the, the antenna at Wallace is actually ba has a um, uh, is based on a, is, is being articulated with a gunnery uh, engine uh, motor that is from the World War II era, right? Seventy years old, uh, so it's a lot of times down. So we have to deal with all these um, indignities of of trying to get the, the bits of data from these small spacecraft down to the Earth uh, uh, for us to to even look at. Um, so this is like uh, my, 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 I think about that cell phone uh, in the movie where you say, you know, it's as easy as a cell phone. I want to be able to take, uh, launch our satellites, use the telecom as a service from, from anywhere in the world and from uh, any time to be able to have that access. And once the data comes down, that it is secure and open and yet, you know, it's reliable. We can easily access it. We can schedule it easily. It, you know the, the right uh, cybersecurity protection is in place, um, and the uh, understanding of of how to hook it up, you know, to, to get to the the uh, that that interface is easy. So um, that cell phone analogy is so apt because I would love to have to not, you know, every time we launch something, have to again restart that clock. So um, with that, I'm I'm probably over time. <laughs> And uh, I like to conclude that I look forward to uh, a future where we can launch our small set system, uh, small sets, and just be able to hook up to this telecom in the sky. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you so much. That's uh, great. Uh, if there's one word I keep hearing in my head. It's opportunity for everybody who is out there today watching. Uh, needless to say, we've had an embarrassment of riches in terms of our expert. Uh, uh, comments. So we're uh, clearly going to extend. Uh, we're already way over, but we'll be extending some more so we can take some of your questions. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we do have a few that are really highlighted, Greg. And uh, let me uh, first start with one. Uh, uh, does NASA have requirements for US based resources? Or would it be acceptable to use overseas resources? I'll represent a group which uh, has 40 experienced U.S. engineers building custom software solutions. 
Yeah, so, you know, national law and policy says we need to, to, to take a, a in, invest in U.S. industry first and foremost, right? But uh, this, this part of the space business is by definition global. Um, we use uh, commercial foreign companies today uh, as part of the NEN. And, uh, you know, I think if a, a foreign company has a U.S. arm um, or subsidiary, that's traditionally how we're able to work with their, those international corporations. While your 10-year goal is commercialization of communications and navigation, what are the interim six months, one year, two year and five year goals? Well, you know, I, I think first and foremost, uh, the next three years are, are coming into uh, a kind of clarity. I think uh, the goal in terms of commercializing our DTE services, I, I, I think you saw we want to do that in uh, effectively the th three year time frame both for our existing and, and uh, new users. And then there's an expe expectation with uh, communication services project and uh, soliciting primarily those earth-based earth relay demos to, to get that accomplished in, in a similar time frame um, to allow us to make that decision, right, to start uh, diverging and uh, pushing users who need earth relay services away from TDRS. Here's a question directed to you specifically. You mentioned the transition to commercial for GEO and below and DSN for Mars, Jupiter and beyond. What are your thoughts on Cislunar and the commercial opportunities there? Yeah, and so that's that's a place we look to exceed our own goals, right? I think uh, Lenitra spoke to the RFI for uh, call it lunar relay communication and navigation services. Uh, we understand the, the moon is the, the place where everyone's going. Um, there's a vested commercial interest that, that exists and the agency is trying to um, instill as well. And so uh, we're looking to, to find opportunities there um, to, to support Artemis and support our, our science uh, aims at the moon as well. I think there was a great announcement from STMD on a tipping point proposal where they're gonna uh, go demonstrate basically 4G LTE technology on the moon surface. Um, I think if, if we were asked to do that 10 years ago, we would probably have gone down the, the government owned and operated in standards route. Um, but you know, using a, a cell phone and a cell tower on the moon, that's the same thing as doing it in Arizona, right? <laughs> and so there was that, that obvious match of uh, commercial technology capability with a specific use case. And so we, we made sure uh, to highlight that and uh, I really look forward to that mission. Excellent. And Greg, you have discussed how large of an impact the commercial sector can have on spacecraft, spacecraft ops. In your opinion, what is the highest point of need for commercialization right now? Uh, for example, uh, or in other words, what is the first problem you think the commercial industry should tackle? Well, I think it, it lies with our last speaker. It's a small stat market, right? I think Penny spoke to the challenges with uh, supporting human spaceflight. The comm services are very intertwined with their operations, right? Um, and so that tit, tit and tat, that back and forth has to happen. Uh, with small stat, I will admit, right, NASA, the agency, we haven't adopted our internal processes and how we onboard missions into our existing networks um, to match basically the, the speed of SmallSat uh, and then the cost and risk profile as well. Again, we're still working, we, our processes are still aligned with onboarding the next JWST or the next pace. And so we understand that the commercial providers are attacking kind of that, we call that compat testing or network integration process and so I think there's going to be a great match there between the commercial capabilities and the, the needs from the small sat market and the small sat guys, they're willing to take those risks, right? If one, you know, if it lasts a year, that's great. Um, if it breaks, they'll launch another one. Uh, and so matchmaking uh, commercial capabilities with the small sat market that addresses effectively a failure on our own accord and puts that community in a much better position than, than they are today. This question uh, relates specifically to what next for uh, one of one of our uh, members of our audience, and I'm sure everybody's thinking this, will NASA be making available current or historical data 
in order for commercial partners to develop future solutions? If data is already available, how can it be accessed? Yeah, so um, that was a question. We've gotten that feedback in previous in industry engagement. And so what we're gonna do, I think um, both Glenn and Goddard, uh, we're working to, together basically to define our needs of our existing mission, missions as they stand in 2019 and 2020 and just release that publicly uh, in terms of the data rates they need, uh, the bands they operate on, um, you know, if they need three or four or five passes a day, uh, that current kind of service level agreement information, uh, as well as kind of the ground side. I think people touched on the ground side, getting the data to the mission operations center or the science operations center, that's also part of this problem. And so we'll be including that uh, geographical information as well. And uh, certainly uh, we'll be releasing some of our internal data on future projections for needs. Admittedly, we have difficulty even today uh, identifying uh, needs for a mission that might launch in 2026, but we can certainly say there's an AO or uh, announcement of opportunity attached to such a mission. One final question. What happens to the TDRS fleet? Uh, would all the spacecraft be super synced? or would ownership of the Constellation be moved to the private sector? Yeah, so th there's no plan to privatize or enter into some sort of uh, partnership uh, to, uh, to operate TDRS on behest of the government. Um, you know, our plan is we're still committing to new missions to fly on TDRS. Those missions last five or 10 years. Um, and so we will maintain that Constellation until the last user uh, has to be turned off. Um, you know, right now we have some runway to take some risk, right, with demonstrations, with commercial SATCOM. Um, but there will be a day, uh, you know, in the, in the 2020s where we're going to say no uh, more missions on TDRS. You have to go to commercial services if you need Earth Relay. But we will maintain and operate that uh, until the last customer is there. And of course, needless to say, uh, when we're confident that uh, we'll be able to make that transition. Right. And, um, you know, that's a challenge, uh, managing demand against supply. Uh, we, we spend a lot of engineering effort to make sure uh, uh, those match up. Well, Greg, thank and, you so and, much. Uh, let, me, let me add something. We are going through, you know, um, a rolling wave demonstration of commercial mm -hmm. capabilities. Once these commercial capabilities have been demonstrated, will take a, a good look, a hard look, how we are going to infuse them into operation. And there is um, a cost aspect to acquiring any new services. So the decision on what to do with TDRS is definitely, um, you know, the TDRS uh, are oversubscribed now. And there are a number of legacy missions that will continue to depend on them. Once they, are, they, they, they start to outlive their usefulness, and we have a, a competitive, viable service available to us. That's the way, that's where we are going. Thank you, Padre. Very good. Thanks, Padre. And uh, one last, we do have one other quick question. Um, how will we access the release of information for NASA ground station needs? And then, um, Padre, we'll turn it over to you for some closing remarks. Yeah, so that, that that information will be attached as effectively appendix to uh, any future solicitation. Um, you know, if if uh, that's going to take too long to arrange, that's something we could uh, work uh, maybe to release uh, more publicly outside a, a direct solicitation. Great, thank you, Greg Budry. Want to close us out? First, I would like to thank you, Al uh, and Irene, and everyone, and and Amanda, and everyone worked with you, including Erica, to make this, to, to, you know, to, to run this event to make it successful. I'm encouraged by the number of participants. You know, I'd like to reassure everyone, we are very serious about our commercialization effort. We really would like to uh, refocus our resources to push the envelope on the new, um, uh, on, on new capabilities going into optical, you know, and from optical into the quantum domain would like to work with industry in response to it, many of these questions uh, th that have been asked. I personally am committed to helping US industry to stand on its feet and to become uh, to, to, to be very competitive. 
the more viable and the more competitive the U.S. industry, space industry is, the more benefit NASA can get uh, from it in terms of acquiring um, new capabilities and reducing the cost to ourselves, you know, in terms of availability of such resources. Um, definitely, we have a lot of challenges. I mentioned one of them was the spectrum, the regulatory things. It takes forever to get the regulatory authorization. We have to take the thing to the ITU to, to be studied. And from there, we need to come back and make sure that the regulators be, make it the law of the land. Um, the spectrum doesn't know any borders and our operation is global. So we need to get the, 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 the approval, the international approval for any su su uh, su uh, such thing to happen. Um, and if spectrum and regulatory uh, uh, issues become an impediment, uh, we are working on the kind of technology that will allow us to maneuver, navigate through the, um, you know, the choppy, um, you know, regulatory waves. And so we'll get there. The technology is there and we would like to make full use of it. Uh, to enable what I called what I called earlier autonomous operation and autonomous navigation, would like to drive the cost of communication down, and would like at the same time to build a very viable, healthy uh, commercial space industry, and working with and that's a you know one of NASA's mission is to 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 enable that. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to to the future where we'll we'll come together as, as a as a good community of interest working jointly to enable that to happen. My thanks to all of the participants uh, that, you know, you guys uh, have endured with us a couple of hours of uh, some of the technical discussions. We took you to the edge of the solar system and beyond to where you know, the supernova uh, is taking place. What NASA does is, is incredible and to be associated with NASA will be very beneficial to anyone who would like to, to work with us. NASA doesn't stop at NASA. We work with many other space agencies and they will follow our lead. We'll work with them to make sure that whatever services are made available to NASA will be made available to other uh, space agencies um, and other government agencies. Uh, so uh, we are looking forward to seeing your responses and, uh, and to establish these bridges of collaboration between what has to what used to be government owned and operated that would like to move away to um, a collaborative environment where the U.S. government works with the space industry to enable it and to acquire much of its uh, needs from it. Thank you again, and um, I will see you at the next stop. Thank you, Badri. We appreciate it. Uh, exciting times for all. Uh, thanks again to our presenters, our panelists. And of course, thank you, our audience, uh, for joining us for Scan the Future. Uh, again, please monitor the uh, websites, uh, nasa.gov slash scan for uh, important schedule updates regarding our virtual industry days. For space-based relay, NASA Glenn will be your host and for Director of Communications, NASA Goddard. Uh, enjoy the remainder of your day and stay well.